this is Russ Siegenberg again. We're on chapter five in the manual today. And we're gonna begin talking about a very important concept that I call spirituality. But first of all, I wanna note that people feel extremely burdened down by their addiction. It affects their mood, it affects their family relations. They often feel cut off from the Lord somewhat, or at least not living the gospel the way they want. And perhaps worst of all, they don't really feel confident that they're going to recover. And so it's a difficult state to be in, and one which is important to have empathy for. And they also might feel pretty lost, like they don't know what direction to go. They've tried many different things to recover. Nothing's quite worked out, and they might not understand why they can't conquer their own feelings and, and get frustrated and angry at themselves. So what is the key for overcoming addictions? Addictions are closely connected to deficits in regulating mood and meeting needs in healthy ways. The addict relies on pornography or sexual acting out for the same reasons an alcoholic drinks. In order to change, new coping skills have to be established so people learn to uh, deal with their emotions and manage their behavior in higher ways. And, and they need to establish a new positive lifestyle so their needs are met in, in righteous ways. Now, all of these things might seem a bit like a fantasy because human beings have a tendency to think that, well, if I don't know how to do it, it's not possible. And I think we don't talk a lot about coping skills and behavior control in our society and so it's quite nebulous. However, this has to be done and I believe if individuals place their faith in the Savior and engage wholeheartedly in the learning process, they'll make quite a bit of progress. But first you have to build hope that it's going to work out. So what is hope? Hope's a belief that things can get better in the future. And beliefs are formed from past experiences, present thoughts, and recent evidence. So to change one's beliefs and ideas and to get more hope, you have to have good experiences. So as you engage in this learning experiences that we have uh, planned for you, you'll uh, start to believe more in the process and you'll like it because Positive living is addictive in a good way. We have to choose our path in life. We have to make decisions. And one of the greatest decisions people can make in life is to choose a spiritual lifestyle. Now that's really hard because we're living in the world and we often have worldly goals and we feel like somehow we're gonna sacrifice too much or give too much up. But I would like to suggest that we can live a spiritual lifestyle and not really feel like we're losing much at all. In fact, mainly gaining. Uh, and to do this, we have to make some decisions. We need not totally change our whole life right away. In fact, I don't know if that's even possible, but we can start taking steps to be on the spiritual path. And so I think we're on the spiritual path when we're making movement and it's on our mind. And so each day to consider some things we can do a little bit differently and, and set some small goals and we can make progress that way and begin to believe in, in this process. Because worldly goals don't really bring peace and happiness. We don't always achieve things we want. It does feel good to pursue goals. Uh, it gives us direction in life and we, we hope that we'll be happy when we reach that goal. It's kind of like if you're in a gold rush and you went chasing off to California or Alaska and thought you'd get rich, people have a lot of energy for such things or, or to get further in one's career or to plan for travel. But none of these things really bring us true happiness and peace. We also know that pleasure seeking doesn't work. People have been trying that experiment for thousands and thousands of years and indulging ourselves in the lusts of the world just doesn't work out and clearly separates us from God. You know, in Alma 41.10, we're told wickedness never was happiness. And that is totally true. There are four essential ingredients to the gospel formula for happiness. And the last one is often overlooked, but it's likely the most important factor in mood management. And all these four factors work together in a synergistic manner. So the first is faith in the Savior. Second might be obedience to the commandments. The third factor would be having the companionship of the Holy Ghost. And the fourth, I'm gonna call that the missing ingredient because we often don't pay enough attention to it. I want to talk about faith in Jesus Christ, which was the first one, and read a scripture, John 14, 6. It says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then in John 3, 16, 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Obedience to commandments is important. We're told in Doctrine and Covenants 98.11, And I give unto you a commandment, that you shall forsake all evil, and cleave unto all good, that you shall live by every word which proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. Of course, this is the covenant of the priesthood, but really applies to all members of the church who are trying to do the Lord's will. And we obey commandments. We also gain experience and we realize that the Lord's ways are good and we become more converted to gospel living. Being born again is important to consider. That well-known scripture in Mosiah 5.2 says, And they all cried with one voice, saying, Yea, we believe all the words which thou hast spoken unto us. And also we know of their surety and truth because of the Spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts, that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. King Benjamin's speech had an amazing effect on the people, and after that they seemed to thrive spiritually. However, it wasn't a permanent change. We can take from these passages that they had an excellent attitude about obeying the commandments. However, in the very next chapter we see that the Nephites began to stray again. Mosiah 6, 7 says, And King Mosiah did cause his people that they should till the earth. And he also himself did till the earth, that thereby he might not become burdensome to his people, that he might do according to that which his father had done in all things. And there was no contention among all his people for the space of three years. Doctrine and Covenants 19.38 says, Pray always, and I'll pour out my Spirit upon you, and great shall be your blessing. So we have the Spirit of the Lord where less disposed to do evil. We establish good patterns, and I, I believe we are conditioned over time to uh, automatically act differently and think differently, but it's a process. It's not a, it's not a one-time shot. It's important to realize this because there are no instant cures in the gospel generally unless the Lord seeks to do a miracle like parting the Red Sea. I want to talk about a hidden resource. The small fishing village of Chungungo in northern Chile is close to the Atacama Desert, the driest place on earth. After a local mine was closed and maintenance on the pipelines to wells 30 miles away stopped, the town went without running water for 20 years. Water had to be brought in by truck and each of the 200 villagers was allotted three and a half gallons per day. However, a new system for obtaining water was developed and they soon had gardens and running water. Here's the question, how did they find water in a desert? The answer is fog nets. While there's little water around Chungungo, there's plenty of fog and the fog is what provides moisture to the, the trees in the area. After some consultation with scientists, huge plastic mesh nets six feet by 78 feet were constructed. The water and fog is already in liquid form, it's just in very, very small drops. The water beads from the fog drip from the net into gutters. The hundred fog collectors that were erected each produced 15,000 liters of water a year for 10 years. Even though they're in this very dry place, they had this plentiful supply of water. We have a hidden spiritual resource in the gospel, which is enjoyable to contemplate and think about and utilize. And I'll read you Doctrine and Covenants 88, 12 to 13. Which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed. And of course that scripture is talking about the light of Christ. And so we can interact with the light of Christ in our own lives and have an extra resource to draw upon to help us spiritually. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 39 to 40 talks about how that works. And unto every kingdom is given a law, and unto every law there are certain bounds and also conditions. All beings who abide not in those conditions are not justified, for intelligence cleaveth unto intelligence, wisdom receiveth wisdom, truth and faith is truth, virtue loveth virtue, and light cleaveth unto light. So the light of Christ works through attraction as we demonstrate certain characteristics and behaviors, we draw in more of the light of Christ. And this is the whole world is judged by the light of Christ because as they do positive things, uh, it should be pleasing to them and they should repeat it. Um, we in the, in the gospel uh, also have the Holy Ghost, but both forces can be working for us. And of course, the Holy Ghost works with the light of Christ as well. We can fill the inner reservoir of our hearts with the light of Christ by immersing ourselves in positive thoughts, emotions, and activity. Extra infusions of pure light, as noted before, come through the Holy Ghost and help keep our reservoir sparkling clear. 
However, we can also pollute the heart with negative thoughts, emotions, desires, and behavior. So we have to be very careful of how we act and how we think. President McKay's told us, Christ has asked us to develop the spiritual within us. Man's earthly existence is but a test as to whether he'll concentrate his efforts, his mind, his soul, upon things which contribute to the comfort and gratification of his physical nature, or whether he'll make as his life's purpose the acquisition of spiritual qualities. President Benson said something similar. The road lies before us. It is clearly marked. The means to travel it are richly provided. We must follow the path set for us by the Son of God in all that we desire, think, and do. Sometimes we focus a lot on what we should be doing, and while this is important, we don't want to forget changing our desires and thoughts because that is an important part of the spiritual path, and it's not impossible. This overall goal is called sanctification. Brigham Young, uh, uh, in a speech to the saints who were a little worried about when the Savior would be returning, said this, Do not be too anxious for the Lord to hasten his work. Instead, let our anxiety be centered upon this one thing, the sanctification of our own hearts, the purifying of our own affections, which would mean emotions, the preparing of ourselves for the approach of events that are to come. Galatians 5.25 tells us, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So that's a goal I would like to urge everyone to consider to develop an ability to walk more in the Spirit. And this would mean as we prepare ourselves spiritually each day and feel more of the Spirit, that we conduct ourselves so that we keep that Spirit with us. And while that takes a lot of practice and a lot of time, I often say to people, do you have something better to do? Because that's why we're here, to change our hearts and to grow in uh, Christ-like behavior. Spirituality can be defined as one, being obedient to the commandments and promptings of the Holy Ghost. Two, maintaining a positive emotional state by cultivating right thoughts and actions. Three, focusing on service to others and personal growth. And four, seeking to be in harmony with other people, nature, and truth. So we're gonna stop right now because we don't wanna to spend too much time on each video and do 5B, which would be the last part of this chapter and talk about some of the uh, particular things we can do each day to live a more spiritual life. Well, thanks for tuning in today and hope you'll be interested in, in listening to the next video.